have you ever said she knows how I feel about her, or he knows, or they know? Well, guess what? Even if she or he or they do, they still need to hear it. Everyone, everyone needs to hear the words, I love you, and hear them often. But simply saying those three little words may not always be enough to communicate just how deeply you care about someone. You may need to say more just to make sure they really know how you feel about them. Well, Paul did exactly that when writing to the Thessalonians. He wanted to make sure they knew how he felt about them because there may have been some question about it. You know, he was only with them for three or four weeks. He left hurriedly and hadn't been back. So he wanted them to know it was not because he didn't care about them. So he made his feelings for them very clear. Speaking for himself and Silas and Timothy, he said, in effect, we want to be with you. We are concerned about you. We rejoice because of you. And we are praying for you. I think we can learn from his example here. We can learn from him the importance of fully communicating that we care. And like him, we begin by letting others know that we want to be with them. We're in the second chapter of 1 Thessalonians, beginning with verse 17. But we, brethren... Having been bereft of you for a short while, in person, not in spirit, we're all the more eager with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, yet Satan thwarted us. For who is our hope or joy or crown of exultation? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Paul addressed the Thessalonians as brethren, as family, and said that they had been bereft of them. But what does that word mean? In English, bereft is a form of the word bereave, which means to be deprived of a loved one's presence. And we most often use it to express the feeling of loss at someone's death. In Greek, however, it means to be rendered an orphan. You know, even though they had only been there a short while and they hadn't been separated in spirit, Paul wanted them to know he felt like an orphan who had been torn away from his family. And he therefore desperately wanted to see them again. In fact, he said, we were all the more eager with great desire to see your face. And the word for great desire can be translated lust. He was saying in the strongest words possible, we really miss you and want to see you again. And he made sure they knew he was speaking for himself. I, Paul, more than once wanted to come to you. Then he made clear why he hadn't come. He said, Satan had thwarted them. Paul knew Satan was doing all he could to keep them apart. He said, literally, that Satan broke up the road between them. Well, how? How did he do that? He doesn't say. It could have been legal restraints brought on by Jason's bond, or sickness, or the press of ministry, or just circumstances, but whatever it was, Satan had a hand in it. And he certainly does all he can to separate brethren and to keep them apart. That in and of itself is all the more reason to make every effort to get together regularly. It must be important if Satan tries so hard to keep us apart. Well, in spite of the roadblocks, Paul really wanted to be with them. But before telling them why, he he raised a question. He says, who is our hope or joy or crown of exultation? 
In other words, who is it that fills us with hope and joy, who makes us so proud that we feel like we've been crowned with a victor's wreath? The answer to his question is you. You are our glory. You are our pride and joy. Paul really wanted the brethren to know how he felt about them. So he wanted to get them thinking about it before telling them. And he didn't want them to think he was just saying it. He really meant it. He not only wanted to be with them, he was thrilled at the prospect of spending eternity with them. His greatest joy would be seeing them in the presence of Jesus when he comes again. Now, knowing he had a hand in their being there would obviously bring him great joy. We will be excited when we see others in heaven that that we've brought before the Lord and guided to the Lord. But you know, I think he's saying something else here. I I think he's simply expressing his joy over the fact that they'd be there together for all eternity. Now, maybe we ought to think of that when we're involved with little squabbles with our brothers and sisters and when we try to avoid them. If we're going to spend eternity together, we better not let Satan keep us apart now. Paul wanted to be with the Thessalonians because they brought him great joy And he told them so. He also told them how concerned he was about them. Let's read on. Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that no man may be disturbed by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we have been destined for this. For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we were going to suffer afflictions. And so it came to pass, as you know. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you and our labor should be in vain. Paul was worried about the Thessalonians. And he wasn't afraid to say so. You know, he had left Thessalonica under less than ideal circumstances. A a mob had been hunting for him and had dragged his host, Jason, before the authorities. Jason had been forced to post some kind of bond, probably assuring the authorities that Paul and Silas would cause no more trouble in town. And then Paul and his party left town under cover of night. When they got to Berea, things went very well until Jews from Thessalonica found out that Paul was there, went there, and stirred up the crowds against him. The new believers in Berea had to rescue Paul, and they took him to Athens. Before they left him in Athens, however, Paul asked them to have Silas and Timothy join him as soon as possible. But after they got there, he then sent Timothy back to Thessalonica, feeling that they needed him more than he did. He knew Timothy would strengthen them. The word he used describes putting a buttress on a wall to make it stronger. He would strengthen them, and he would encourage them. You know, if Paul couldn't be there, he'd send his right-hand man, a brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to help them. And he wanted them to know he had done everything possible to strengthen and encourage them. He did so because he didn't want them to be disturbed by the afflictions they were going through. He didn't want their faith to be shaken by the persecutions they were surely experiencing. And you know, persecutions shouldn't have come as a surprise to them because he had told them they were destined to suffer for the faith. He had made every effort to prepare them for the future. He didn't want them to wonder what was going on when their newfound faith didn't solve all their problems. And it actually brought new problems and challenges 
into their life. He had followed Jesus' example by making sure they knew what it would cost to be a disciple. He didn't promise a bed of roses. He didn't want them to think it would be easy to follow Jesus. But Paul knew what they would go through would be hard for them, no matter how well prepared they were. And like a parent who had done everything possible to prepare a child before sending them out into the world, he still worried about them and wasn't afraid to let them know. And when he could endure it no longer, the word describes a pot springing a leak. When he couldn't contain his anxiety about them any longer, he sent Timothy to find out how they were doing. <laughs> like a nosy parent, Paul wanted to know his children in faith were okay. He wanted to know that they were, they were doing the right things and, and how they were doing. But he didn't check up on them because he lacked confidence in them. And kids, when mom and dad check up on you or follow you on Life 360, don't assume it's because they don't trust you. Now, if you've given them reason not to trust you, that might be the reason. But more often than not, it's just because they know how tough it is out there. And they're worried. They care. Paul was worried. He knew what they were up against. He said he checked on them for fear that the tempter might have tempted them. He knew how hard Satan would be trying to destroy them. He knew the devil was prowling about Thessalonica seeking to devour his babes in Christ. And he didn't want them to think they had to fight the devil on their own. Now, I do realize that some parents believe when children leave the nest, they are on their own. They raise them to be independent and don't want them dependent on anyone. Well, Marilyn and I have never felt that way. We want our kids and grandkids to de be dependent, to depend on God, and to know they can depend on us. You know, we're usually delighted when they ask for a favor <laughs> or FaceTime us to share what they're doing or call just to find out what we're doing. We don't want them to think they're orphans. And spiritual children should never feel like orphans either. They should never feel they have to go it alone. Of course, they should know the Lord is always with them, but they should also know there are spiritual moms and dads and sisters and brothers who are there for them. They need to know you care and that you're willing to do whatever you can to help them. They need to know you're watching out for them. And as did Paul, your children should know how happy you are when you find out they're doing good. Let's keep going. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you, for this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you through your faith. For now, we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account, as we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete what is lacking in your faith. By now, Paul had gone on to Corinth. Silas had joined him earlier, and when Timothy got there, he brought good news. The word translates also gospel, especially when referring to the good news of Jesus. 
Timothy brought some really good news about the Thessalonians, how they were standing firm, trusting in God, and expressing love for one another. And Paul told them how happy he was to hear about their faith and love. He told them how proud he was of them. They needed to hear it. And Paul needed to say it. The things that really mattered, their faith in God and the way they were treating each other brought great joy to Paul, and he told them so. He also let them know how important it was for him to know that their feelings were mutual. When he found out they wanted to see him as much as he did them, it comforted him. It enabled him to handle the affliction he was going through. Sometimes we forget that parents need encouragement too, both physical and spiritual parents. It's easy for parents to think they failed, that they didn't do all they should have done for their kids. And I'm sure that we all did fall short in some areas. But we did some things right and need to be reminded of our successes. Like Paul, we need to know that our offspring think kindly of us, that they appreciate what we did for them and think we did a good job raising them. Paul was glad to hear he had done a good job. And he said he really came to life when he heard the Thessalonians were standing standing firm in the Lord. He openly thanked God for them. He rejoiced before God on their account. And he prayed day and night that he might see them again, that he might have a chance to complete what was lacking in their faith. Now, He wasn't being critical here. He wasn't saying, oh, you're missing something. He just knew that he could do more for them. And he wanted to see them so he could. You know, a parent's job is never done. The parent-child relationship does change in many ways. But parents never stop praying for their kids. Now, may our God and Father himself and Jesus our Lord direct our way to you. And may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another and for all men, just as we also do for you, so that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Paul prayed that he would be able to visit the Thessalonians again and again. He let them know it. He wanted to spend time with them, and he prayed that God would continue working in their life and in his. He'd already expressed thanks for their faith and love, Now he prayed that God would cause their love to increase and abound for one another and for all men, just as his love was increasing for them. And his ultimate prayer was that they would be ready for the Lord's return, that their hearts would be blameless when they appeared before God at the coming of Jesus with all the saints that on judgment day they would be declared unblameable in holiness because they had lived lives that were set apart for their heavenly Father. You know, if they would, the second coming would obviously be a time of great rejoicing. For the God who loves them, the Savior who died for them, and the spiritual parents who helped birth them. Indeed, the second coming will be a time of rejoicing for all of us if we're ready. And we can be ready because Jesus is willing to cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Free from the stain of sin 
and free to be set apart saints who encourage each other to live holy lives. And we do that by communicating that we care. By making it clear that we really do want to be together. By openly showing concern for each other's well-being. By rejoicing when we hear of spiritual victories. And by praying for one another. If we do that, the second coming will be a family reunion like no other. And we'll all be there. Let's celebrate that now. Stand.